Well, good morning and welcome to River City Church Online. Thank you for getting on board with us today and on board in a positive way. That word on board is going to come up a few times in announcements in a vital way for River City. So watch for that word this morning. Today, for our message from Daryl, you're going to be hearing more in our series, Why Pray? And today's topic is about what happens when prayer is not working. And so if you've had problems with prayer, probably Daryl is going to give you some guidance today that is going to help you move forward with prayer. Now, in our announcement segment, I've got lots of important things happening to share with you. And these things include, and this is just your highlights, that we're going to be having a very special prayer and communion service on May 2nd. It's a very important event for anyone who calls River City Church their home. If you've grown here in your faith and all those kinds of things, we are dealing with some stuff behind the scenes that we are going to be uniting in prayer about, so you will want to be informed about that. Also, the Global 6K, I got my shirt on today, and this is the one from 2017. I've been doing this for a few years now, and we're going to be reinvigorating uh, our team, restocking that team over the next couple of weeks, getting ready to participate on May 29th. I'm going to give you more information about that. As well, I want to remind you how you can connect in these times when we are staying at home. We've got virtual events that you can participate in and not feel isolated, not feel that you are apart from your community of faith. So do pay attention to the announcements following the message today. All right, right now we're going to head into worship with our worship team. Sean will have something for us and then Daryl will be up following that. Thanks for joining us today. And if you're new here, we just are so blessed to have you joining us and participating online in our service. We are here to serve you and we hope that you will pop a message into the chat, chat line down below. Um, also, if you are interested in taking things a little bit further, getting to know more about River City Church, pop onto our website and click on contact us. That way we can start up a dialogue together online through email and find out how River City Church might be a place where you want to spend more of your time and to grow your faith. Thanks for tuning in today and we'll check in with you after the message. Well, hey, good morning, River City. I'm joining you this morning from the front seat of my car. And you might be wondering why I'm in my car. Uh, no, it's not because Melinda's kicked me out yet. Um, it's because it's quiet. You see, I live in a house with three young children uh, who are amazing human beings, uh, but quiet is not a word I would use to describe them. And so this afternoon, I uh, had planned to take a little afternoon retreat of solitude, and I was hoping to go over to Creef and walk the trails there. Uh, but like so many things, it's closed. And so here I am in my car, and it is wonderfully quiet here. And if you're anything like me, I'm the kind of person that gets very easily distracted, and I have a hard time, especially with things like prayer um, and devotions, when there's loud kind of things happening around me and there's lots of chaos and, and, and hustle and bustle. And so I'm the kind of person that I think I need more times where I regularly build in retreat. And maybe you're like me. And if you're like me, I encourage you to do that, to build in more times of retreat. And this morning, before we go into worship, I want to just invite you to pray with me here in the front seat of my car. And you, wherever you are, find a little place of, of quiet and let's pray together before we start worshiping. Let's prepare our hearts to go into a time of worship this morning. Heavenly God, we thank you for times of solitude. Thank you, Jesus, for showing us a model where you would leave the crowds and go off on your own to spend time alone with your Father. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would help us to know our own 
habits, to know our own weaknesses well enough to know how best to pray. Help us to, in spite of everything that's going on, to find times of stillness and solitude and retreat where we can experience time one-on-one with you, even if it's in the front seat of our car. God, as we go into a time of worship this morning, I pray that you would be honored and exalted. I pray that you would use this time of worship to revive us and restore us. Would it nurture our souls and encourage our hearts? Help to remind us, Lord, that it is through prayer and regular times of connecting with you that we are strengthened and we are encouraged and filled with hope for the difficult times ahead. We commit this time to you, Jesus, and pray you would be honored by it. In your name, amen. of my enemies I raise a hallelujah louder than the unbelief I raise a hallelujah my weapon is a melody I raise a
in the middle of a storm. Well, good morning. Thanks for tuning into this service today. Uh, a warm welcome to all of you who have returned for installment two uh, in this new series that we're calling Why Pray? And uh, that's the question we looked at last time. Like, why pray? Right? And while there are numerous reasons that one could give or that we could give for why a person might pray, I spent a lot of time narrowing it down to the top two reasons, what I consider the, the best two reasons for people who see themselves as Christians or followers of Christ uh, for them to pray. And uh, number one in that list is pray because prayer was a hallmark of Jesus' life and his ministry. You'd think, wouldn't you, that if there was any human in history who uh, would not need to pray, it would be Jesus. After all, he was the sinless son of God. And yet, it's ironically, it's the exact opposite. Uh, Jesus frequently prayed, and numerous times in the Gospels, we see accounts of Jesus praying in all different contexts and in numerous different ways. So first we pray because uh, Jesus prayed. He modeled prayer. We'll discover this morning he taught prayer. Prayer was obviously a priority for him, and so prayer must be a priority for those of us who identify as his followers. That's number one. The second reason, by way of a quick review, is uh, pray because apart from prayer, you cannot have a real relationship with God. Apart from prayer, you can't have a real relationship with God. Prayer is an essential aspect of our relationship with our Creator God. Now, if you're watching and you say, well, I don't even want a relationship with God, well, then no problem. Then don't pray and don't worry about it. The concern comes when, and this happens pretty frequently, the concern comes when someone comes to me and says, Daryl, I don't feel close to God. And I'll be like, well, do you want to feel close to God? And they'll answer, yeah, I do. (sighs) Well, tell me a little bit about your prayer life. And the concern comes when they answer that question by saying, well, actually, I don't really have a prayer life. If that's your situation, well, then you have a problem. And it's because Without an active prayer life, not only will you not feel close to God, but the longer you take to launch an active prayer life, the likelier it will be that your relationship, whatever relationship exists with God, is going to fall away. It's going to grow cold. So, serious reason why believers should pray. Just as drinking water daily is essential for proper functioning of our physical body. So daily prayer is critical to having a healthy and growing relationship with our Creator God. So that was last time. 
But here comes the next question, how? Like, how should I pray? And people might be asking that question. You might be asking that question for one of several different reasons. One reason might be this, um, and this would maybe be true, especially of those of you who are a little older. You might be saying, listen, when I was young, I was taught there's one proper way to pray. Some of you may have even been told that there's a certain tone that you're supposed to use when you pray. And so now that you're grown up, you might be wondering, well, is that true? Is there only one way to pray? Others of you, you want to know how to pray because no one taught you. Um, you didn't grow up in a Christian home. And although you've heard me pray uh, in these online messages, uh, maybe you've heard River City staff pray, no one has ever stopped to teach you how to pray until today. That's another reason. Others of you, maybe you learned to pray. Maybe your parents were believers and they taught you when you were young. They taught you when you were a child, right? But those prayers that you learned when you were a child, well, now that you're a teen or an adult, they just don't resonate with what it is that you're going through in life today. Um, although you grew up, your prayer life never really did. So how do now, I, how, now how do I pray that I'm an adult? That's another reason. And then, of course, there's the practical reason, right? How do I pray? Because although I try to pray and although it looks like prayers I see other people doing, whatever it is, it don't feel like it's working. Whatever it is that I'm doing, it just doesn't feel like it's working. So how should I pray? Well, these reasons and more besides, they, they spotlight the relevance of today's topic. Now, before we get to the how to pray, I want you to check out this brief skit, which is going to show us, with a little bit of humor, how not to pray. Check it out. When you think about your prayer life, what does it look like? Is it giving God a list of things that you think you need? Is he able to get in a word in edgewise? You know, prayer is supposed to be deepening and enriching our relationship with God. But do you think that one-sided conversations do that? Have you ever thought about what a one-sided conversation would look like in real life? Well, in case you're wondering, my son Eli is here with me, and we're going to show you what that would look like. Hey, Eli, how are you? I love your shirt. I love that red color. You know what? I'm just so glad you're my son. I love you so, so much. And I'm just so proud of the person that you're becoming. See ya! Hey, Eli. I'm so sorry that we haven't been able to go tubing over the winter like we wanted to, or that we haven't gone bike riding yet. But you know what? When these COVID restrictions are over, we're going to do some cool stuff. How does that sound? Nah. See you later! Eli, thanks so much for being so helpful around the house for mopping the floors the other day and doing the dishes and just being such a helpful boy. I just really appreciate it. Nice talking to you. Bye. Hey, Eli, I was thinking that it would be really great if you could help me around the house, if, um, if you could clean up your room and maybe help me with the laundry. You know, there's a sink full of dishes. You know, that would be just so super. And, you know, if you can spend a little less time on electronics, I would really appreciate that. What do you think? Um, You're so great, buddy. I love you. Bye. So how do you think those conversations between Eli and I went down? if you'd even call them conversations. Eli didn't get a chance to say anything, answer any questions, or even put in his two cents. But you know, that's sometimes how our conversations with God looks like. More than anything, he desires to have a deep and abiding relationship with us, but we don't give him any opportunity to speak or answer our questions. Maybe as we move forward in our prayer life in this series, we can think about um, how to have a two-way conversation with God and go a little more deep with him. Big thank you to Juliet and to Eli for uh, that skit that we could watch. And I don't know what your reaction was to what you saw in that skit, but for me, what I saw, it cut close to home. Because what I saw there is a pretty good model of how I used to pray and how I prayed for much of my life. 
I prayed like prayer was a one-way monologue where I spoke and God did nothing but listen. Honestly, I, I, I never expected God to speak. Now, you might be wondering, well, well, did he speak to you? And I will admit that there were times, even during those earlier years of my prayer life, when during a prayer or shortly after a prayer, I would hear God speaking to me. Not audibly, like someone you know, in the room beside me, not audibly so that if there was someone else in the room, they would have heard God speaking as well. But God speaking as an inner conviction where I knew that I knew that I was hearing from God. And obviously, I, tr- I treasured those times. I mean, they, they're the times that really strengthen your faith. They help you to keep floating when you're going through some of the storms of life and of faith. But you know what? I did nothing to facilitate the kind of conditions that would increase the frequency of my hearing from God. I didn't actively seek to hear God's voice in my prayer life. Now, I trust you all know Tiger Woods, right? The greatest golfer in history. I I don't think it's, it's arguably. I think he's the greatest golfer in history. And one of the amazing things about Tiger Woods uh, is that he's changed his golf swing, not once, not twice, not three times, four times. And as I was checking out a, a bleacher report earlier this week, it sounds like he's, he's working on his fifth swing modification, even though he's a veteran golfer. And I want to talk about the very first time that Tiger would change the way that he played golf. The, the, the first time that he changed his swing, it was, it was between 1997 and uh, 1999. And uh, he became a pro golfer in 1996. And many asked why he was taking time off, like in the peak of his career, to alter his golfing swing. After all, up to that point in his professional career, he'd won 21% of PGA Tour events. 21%, like one in every five Tiger would win. And he won 25% of the Masters that he attended. So he was winning like one in four of those, including he won the 1997 Masters event in Augusta, Georgia by 12 strokes over the nearest opponent. So he decimated the other golfers. And the reason that Tiger changed his golf swing was twofold. Number one, he recognized that the way he was swinging the ball would severely shorten his career as a professional golfer because it was taking a a toll on his body, particularly his back. So he wanted to continue to be a a professional golfer for many years. So that was reason number one. The second reason was Tiger truly believed that there was still room for improvement in his golf swing. Well, that transition to a new golf swing took over two years. Took over two years which is a major investment of time, especially when you're a professional earning your bread and butter from the game of golf, and especially when you're in the peak years of your playing time. Two years. But the end of the story is Tiger returned to his winning form. And guess what? Here we are, what, some 22 years later, and Tiger is still a a top-ranked golfer. I, I checked this week and he's ranked 70th best golfer in the world out of hundreds of professional golfers. Well, I tell you that story because two years ago I changed my prayer swing, right? Tiger changed his golf swing. I changed my prayer swing. I intentionally started focusing on balancing my prayer life with the prayers that I was used to, which were more monologue, right? Where I was talking to God with another type of prayer called listening prayers. So I started increasing the amount of times I was practicing in listening prayer. And maybe that's a new term for you. If you were part of the series we did at River City last summer, uh, one of the messages in that series was on listening prayer. But let me just very quickly flesh it out for you a bit. In listening prayer, you, you have to slow down. You slow down the whole process of prayer. And essentially, what you do is you, you ask God questions while you're praying And then you wait for whatever amount of time you wait 
for God to answer. Now, especially early on when you're just practicing listening prayer, you, you don't always hear a clear answer. You don't always receive what you consider a clear word from God. But as you persist in this discipline, as you learn a new swing, right, a new golf swing, a new prayer swing, you will see signs of improvement. And so I want to encourage any of you who are tuning in today who want to begin to practice or to investigate listening prayer. A few words about listening prayer. Now, I mostly practice listening prayer in my personal devotion. So this is something I reserve for my most intimate times with God. So that's my personal prayer times. And here are three quick tips that will help you if you're just uh, intending to try listening prayer, maybe today, maybe this coming week. So tip number one, you got to have a quiet space. So find a space that's quiet and free from distractions. Like you don't want dogs jumping up on the arm of your couch or whatever, right? Number two, write your prayers in a journal. This is something that helps me to focus. And so I'll write a question that I have for God into my journal as a prayer, prayer question. And then with my pen in hand, I will literally wait. It's often with my other hand open or something. And I'll just wait for 30 seconds or a minute. Um, and sometimes I receive a word and other times I don't. And when I receive a word, I write it down. I, in the space under what I've written as my prayer, I write down and I'll say something like this, God, I believe that you're telling me to, or God, I believe that I'm hearing this and I'll write it out and then I'll say, is this correct? And then again, with my pen in hand, I'll wait. So it's really slowing down your prayer time. A, a third tip that I'll give you is I use scripture. So I would encourage you, if you want to practice listening prayer, to use scripture. And, and what, what I do is I read a verse or a passage from the Bible and then I I ask God what it is that he wants me to take away. What's his personal word for me, right? I mean, that, that word can speak to anybody who's reading it, but what, what's God want me to hear? And then I'll write it down. Lord, what is it you want me to apply to my life from this verse? And again, uh, I wait for an answer and sometimes I get a clear answer and sometimes I don't. But when I do, I write it down. Now again, I'm just a novice, right? I'm just trying to perfect a, a, a new swing, a new prayer swing. But I know, I know for certain that this is a practice that I will continue through the rest of my life. And I'll continue it for two reasons. Number one, it blesses me. I mean, there is nothing that compares with hearing and feeling confirmation that you're hearing a personal word from God to you. So that's reason number one. And the second reason I'm, I'm going to keep practicing listening prayers because I believe it honors God. It honors God when we slow down and when we pause and when we ask him questions and then, then actually give him time to respond. It honors God the same way that Mary honored Jesus in that well-known story where Martha's preparing dinner and meanwhile her sister Mary sat at Jesus' feet and listened. We honor God like Mary did when she sat at Jesus' feet. Incidentally, that story of Mary and Martha, it's recorded in the Bible immediately before our text today, which is from Luke chapter 11. So think back to our skit. Imagine how different Eli would have felt if instead of just rattling off her list, instead of just talking away and then rushing off before Eli could say anything, imagine the difference that Eli would feel if Juliet would have just sat there and looked him in the eye and given Eli time to answer. I mean, it would be a huge difference, wouldn't it? It'd be like day and night. He would feel honored. And so we honor God when we practice listening prayer. Now, there's a fascinating account in the Gospels. I already told you what our text is. So if you've got a Bible or a Bible app, I'd encourage you to open it or start it up to Luke chapter 11, the Gospel of Luke chapter 11, and it is a fascinating story for a number of reasons, and I'm going to just highlight one of them today. 
Because while this is a story that I believe many of you have heard, and most of you have probably even read, I want you to reflect on, like, have I ever stopped and considered what makes this story fascinating? And today I would invite you to do that as I, as I read our text. So Luke chapter 11, and uh, really Luke 11 talks about prayer. Jesus here talks about prayer from verse 1 all the way to verse 13. And this is such rich material. We only have time for the first four verses this morning. So if you want to dig deeper, I would encourage you to also on your own read verses 5 through 13 because Jesus fleshes out more answers to today's question of of how to pray, right? How to pray. So Luke uh, chapter 11, starting at verse 1. God's Word. One day... Jesus was praying in a certain place. Now, did I mention that prayer was central to Jesus' life and ministry? When he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, just as John taught his disciples, John here being John the Baptist. Now, it's interesting. Jesus' disciple asks him, how should I pray? And that is the very question that we're looking at this morning here at River City. And here's what's fascinating. Luke 11 occurs basically at the midpoint of Luke's gospel. So for the sake of argument, let's say this is smack dab in the middle of Jesus' ministry. His ministry was about three years, right, give or take. And so let's assume this was at least a year into Jesus' ministry, maybe a year and a half into his ministry, So the disciples, the 12 disciples, which he picked at the start of his ministry, they would have been traveling with him and living with him for some time now. Now we know that all Jesus' original disciples were Jews. They were born into Jewish families. They'd been raised in the Jewish faith, meaning that they were worshiping at local synagogues or at the temple. They had learned prayer since they could breathe their first breath. What's more... We know all Jesus' disciples were adults, right? We, we believe that the disciple John was quite young, but he was still, you know, maybe in his late teens or early 20s. But they were all adults, which means that when it comes to prayer, they were veterans. They were well-seasoned. Nevertheless, one of them in our passage comes to Jesus while Jesus is praying with an important question he's just itching to ask. Yet, he must have known or sensed that it would be rude to interrupt Jesus while he was praying. So the text tells us he waited till Jesus was finished. And then he asks his pressing question. Jesus, would you teach, and then notice, not me, but us, to pray? Now, it's curious, right? When we're reading the Bible carefully like this, and we see something curious like, someone singular asking a question related to plural, then we ought to ask, why is that? What's this telling us? And I suspect it's telling us that uh, this disciple who was asking Jesus was representing the group. That, you know, maybe the others had said, hey, Peter, you're courageous, right? Like, you're always the one who leads the group, even if it means stepping out of a boat and walking on water. Would you go ask Jesus this question? Because look at him. Look how he's praying, right? Apparently, during their time with Jesus, they'd seen him pray. They'd heard him pray. And how Jesus prayed, the satisfaction that was evident in Jesus' face, the joy that was evident in Jesus' face, uh, the sense of connection that Jesus enjoyed with God the Father during his times of prayer was markedly different than theirs. And they want that thing too. They want it because when I say different, it's different good. Jesus, we want to learn to pray like you pray. Would you please teach us? Well, the next part of our passage is going to be familiar to all of you, even if this is your very first time, not just tuning into a River City church service, but any church service. Luke chapter 11, verses 2 through 4. Jesus said, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who sins against us. 
and lead us not into temptation. So the disciple asked Jesus how to pray, and that's the prayer that Jesus gave. And today we refer to that prayer that I just prayed, reading from Jesus in Luke chapter 11, verses 2 through 4. We refer to that prayer as the Lord's Prayer, the Lord's Prayer. And you say, well, why is it called that? Well, it's because it's the Lord, Jesus, who teaches it to us. So he's the one who gave us this prayer. And those of you familiar with that prayer, you may have noted it's a little different in the form that I just quoted from Luke chapter 11 than maybe what you memorized or maybe what you're familiar to praying. And that's because mostly when the Lord's Prayer is prayed, uh, the version that's used is the one that's found in Matthew's Gospel, right? So there are four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We're looking at Luke's Gospel. Matthew's Gospel also has this prayer. And the two prayers, the two versions are basically the same. But while Matthew's version includes seven requests, Luke's version includes just five requests. So it's, Luke's is just a little bit shorter. Luke includes, Father God, may your name be hallowed, right? May the holiness of your name be recognized. Number two, may your kingdom come. Right? The kingdom as it is in heaven, would it come down to this earth? Number three, would you give us food for today? Number four, would you forgive us our sins? And number five, would you keep us from falling into temptation? Matthew includes those five and he adds two more. He adds, may your will be done on this earth as it is in heaven. And his seventh one that he adds is deliver us from the evil one. So you got five to seven requests, depending on which version, which gospel you're looking at. And in both versions, the requests start with God. The requests start with God, right? May your name be recognized and made holy on this earth. May your kingdom come to this earth. And may your will be done by us earthlings. That's essentially the opening three requests that we find in Matthew's version. So in both versions, the prayer begins with the one praying, blessing and praising God. Praising God and blessing God's name. And you say, what should we take from this? Now remember, Jesus is answering the question, how should you pray? He's answering today's sermon question. What do we take from this? How about this? In your prayer, when you open your prayer, begin by blessing God and praising his name. Begin by praising God. Picture prayer as a house. Praise is the doorway into the house. Picture prayer as a house. Praise is the doorway into the house. Charles Spurgeon, a famous uh, preacher, uh, once said, One never ought attempt pray without going through the door of praise. Right? Don't go into the house through the window. Right? Don't knock another hole into the house. Enter the house of prayer through the door of praise. Another thing that both of the versions of the Lord's Prayer share is that after making these requests to God, right, about praising God and blessing God, the person who's praying it is encouraged and invited to make requests for him or herself, right? In other words, according to Jesus, it's okay for us to ask God things. It's okay for us to share the burdens on our heart it's okay to ask for things that will bless us as well, which I hope you take as encouragement. Now, the requests that relate to the one praying, they fall into three categories. And again, because Jesus is teaching us how to pray, I'm going to suggest that we keep these categories in mind when we pray as well. So category number one, we're to pray for our daily needs. While most of us in affluent Canada, and maybe you're watching from other Western countries, while we don't really have a fear or a concern about our daily food, most of us, I think it's still important that we acknowledge and thank God for our food, that we acknowledge and we recognize where that food comes from. It comes from the fact that God provides us health and strength to do our jobs, which gives us a paycheck. He provides us with employment. He provides us with uh, the job itself. And so praying for our daily needs could include things like 
uh, asking God to receive our thanks for the food that we can eat, our thanks for the job that we have, our thanks for the health that we have. And if any or all of those things are lacking, then we turn those into petitions and we're like, God, we need food for today. Please provide. I need a job. Open my eyes to opportunities and give me the words that I need during interviews or help my resume to rise to the top of the the pile on someone's desk and so forth. So number one, we pray related to our daily needs. Number two category is we pray related to our sins. Our sins are the things that they weigh us down, right? Uh, Sin is not a popular word today, but think of the things that you do that you regret. Think of the guilt that you carry. God doesn't want you to carry that. He doesn't want you to live with that. He wants you to confess it to him and ask for forgiveness in Jesus' name. And so category two is we're we're encouraged to ask for forgiveness for our, our failures and for our shortcomings. And we're to ask God for strength through the power of the Holy Spirit to withstand the things that tempt us and to lure us away from our faith. Third category, we're to pray for deliverance in spiritual warfare. We're to pray for deliverance from our number one enemy, Satan, or the devil. The Bible in 1 Peter 5 verse 8 tells us that the devil is like a roaring lion prowling around seeking someone to devour. It's a, kind of a scary picture. And it suggests to me that the devil doesn't take holidays, he doesn't take days off, which means that every single day, those of us who want to be overcomers, those of us who want to live in a victorious faith, we need to be praying for deliverance from that enemy. We need to be praying and be watchful for that prowling lion so that we can be prepared for him. So the Lord's Prayer itself answers today's question, how to pray. Let me sum it up for you. Number one, pray like Jesus taught you to pray in the Lord's Prayer. Right? Start by praising God and blessing His name. And only when you've blessed God, when you've praised God, then you move on to your own personal requests. That said, God welcomes any and all requests that you have. He he welcomes the ones related to your daily needs. He welcomes the ones related to your sin and your desire for a clean, fresh slate, a new start. And he welcomes the one related to your desire for deliverance and your, your earnest desire to be an overcomer. So that's the first thing. Let's use Jesus' model prayer to guide us in our personal conversations with God. And number two, As I said earlier, make time to introduce listening prayer into whatever prayer regimen, uh, prayer swing you've currently been using. And uh, this morning earlier, I gave some tips about how you can begin to practice listening prayer, even if you've never done it before. So River City, now that you know how to pray, really it's up to you to do it. It's up to you to choose whether you're going to make prayer a part of your life or not. I hope that you do. In fact, I pray that you do. And I want to encourage you by sharing the following. For 15 months now, I've been part of a mentoring group for pastors. There's uh, 12 of us who are being mentored via Zoom every Thursday by a pastor who's on staff at a church in Manitoba named Chris. This week, Thursday afternoon, Chris kind of threw our existing agenda out the window and we devoted our time together to looking at passages about what it means to be an overcomer in Jesus Christ. And then we spent the last half of our time praying together as pastors during that Zoom call. And the reason we did that, and this is really important for you to hear, is because with a heavy heart, Chris shared that their extensive network that they keep in touch with of churches throughout North America and the world, but the the network in North America, they're discovering that many pastors are actually resigning. Pastors of churches are resigning right now. 
which means they're quitting their jobs. They're, they're leaving ministry altogether. Ministry in a post-Christian or secular context, it, it's hard enough, period, even prior to COVID. And now with COVID, it's backbreaking. I know many of you are in professions or in jobs where it's backbreaking too because of COVID. And it's been a challenge for all of us. It's backbreaking for pastors because mostly it's online. And so you feel disconnected from your congregation. You feel disconnected from the very people that you love and want to serve. And when you serve, even when you serve them online, you feel ineffective. You feel like you're not meeting their needs or you're not connecting with them at the level that they really desire. Another reason it's, it's been tough for pastors during pandemic is because much of your pastoral care is directed towards struggles and problems and pain. There's not really a balance like the, the percent of pastoral care that relates to joy and, 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 and the celebrations of life. That's way down and, and it's the heaviness that we're dealing with, it seems. right? People dealing with job concerns or even unemployment, people dealing with death of loved ones or people that they're asking us to pray for because they've contracted the coronavirus, people dealing with various fears, anxieties, and as we looked at a couple weeks ago, depression as well. And then on top of that, most churches are actually experiencing a pretty high level of of, of, it's even more than tension. It's uh, division right now. Now, I haven't seen tons of this at River City, but I've seen glimpses of it. And this division, it's over things like sh- sh- people who really feel strongly about being vaccinated or people who feel really strongly about not being vaccinated. And about not making the space in the body of Christ for both views to coexist. The tension is about those who want the doors of the church open and services to be in person. And those who want the doors to stay closed. Because we need to send a message to our community that we're participating with them in physical distancing and all the rest. And those are just a couple examples of the division. I could go on. It's... It's really sad, especially if you think that our enemy would love nothing more than churches to be divided. And I could go on about why pastors are resigning in high numbers throughout North America, but I think you know where I'm coming from. Well, in addition to all the burdens and all the stresses that I just shared with you, and there's a mountain there, you know that I and your leadership were dealing with this court case. And it has been draining. And again, we're in a time of uncertainty. Again, we're in a season of waiting. Like we didn't, did we not learn our lesson about waiting from all the times of waiting in the last few years? I feel, and I have heard from other board members So I know your leadership feels an awesome responsibility, an awesome burden to protect your money. And I know ultimately it's the Lord's money, but when I say protect your money, I mean protect the money of any and every one of you, near and far, who contributed to our capital campaign. We feel that burden and we're doing all that we can to protect that. And in addition to that, any of you who call River City church home know that I see myself even less as a pastor and more as a missionary. I have a missionary heart. I have a heart for people who are just outside the the Christian community or for people who are just like wading into the Christian community. And so that means River City has a lot of young, brand new believers, People who have come here because they've experienced conflict or pain or division in their families or some of you in previous churches that caused you to stop going to church and, and, 
you're feeling your anxiety level rise because you know we're in this court case and it's bringing up PTS, like PTSD, post-traumatic stress, because you remember what that was like. And man, I want to protect each and every one of you from that as well. At any rate, all I can say is this. Were it not for these weekly mentoring sessions, including the devotional accountability it provides, including the listening prayer that I've been practicing, including the scripture memorization and meditation, I believe, shamefully, I'd probably be one of those pastors resigning or even talking about resigning. Were it not for the prayer and devotional life that's been nurtured in me through this mentoring over the past 15 months, I'd have, I believe that I would have resigned at some point. For even youth grow tired and weary and young men stumble and fall. (laughs) And I'm a middle-aged man, they say. But because of my experience over the past 15 months, I can say this. And I invite you to hear this through the context of prayer. When we seek God and when we spend time listening to Him in prayer, Things go differently. For those who wait on the Lord will renew their strength. They will rise up with wings like eagles. They will run and not be weary. And they will walk and not be faint. So let's be a people of prayer and let's be a church of prayer. We've looked at the why of prayer. You've now looked at the how of prayer. Next week, we're going to look at how we can turn our uh, micro prayers into macro prayers. And if you have no idea what that means, all the more reason to join us next week. Well, ironically, rather than end this message with prayer, I'll leave time for you to practice that on your own. Today, I want to leave you with this blessing. So receive this blessing. River City, God go before you to lead you. God go behind you to protect you. God go beneath you to support you. God go beside you to befriend you. Do not be afraid. May the blessing of God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be upon you. Do not be afraid. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Amen. Thank you for tuning in today to River City Church Online and getting on board with learning more about prayer. Hopefully you'll take some of those strategies into your week and experience more closeness with God. Now, as we head into the announcements, I'm going to help you with getting on board with things related to community, um, getting on board with some ways that you can put love and action in the future in our community as well. And hopefully you'll have some strategies for getting through this pandemic and some of the social isolation that you might feel won't be so prevalent for you. And so I want to remind you about some of our virtual events that we have going on that are happening all the time. On Sunday mornings, we have Kid City at 9 a.m. and they have a Zoom meetup that they do to do a little uh, Bible study lesson, if you will, and some conversation amongst the, the, the kids and they do some games. They have a great time. Also, we have at 11 a.m., we have our Zoom connection break, and that's for adults to gather after the service that runs at 10 a.m. We just uh, have a little bit of time to check in with one another, and we share a, a brief prayer at the end. It's a lovely time, and you are welcome to join us. Um, we also have small groups that run throughout the week, and they're in the evenings. They run virtually as well. Sometimes when the pandemic restrictions have lifted, we've been able to meet in person. Right now, we'll be doing those virtually though. Now, if any of those things sounds interesting to you, or you'd like to maybe 
get to know our community a little bit more, you're feeling that pull, then we would love for you to join us. And all you need to do is go on our webpage and click on contact us. That is the way that you can get in touch with us. You can ask us questions about some of these programs and see how you can get, get in on them, okay? All right, so there's one item that I didn't allude to at the beginning of today's service, and I need to shoehorn it in here, and that's related to our volunteers. This past week, I was reading the Cambridge Times, and I noticed a big ad that it is the National Volunteer Week, and that is starting today. So for sure, River City Church should do a little something to pay attention to some its some of its volunteers. Now, we have a lot of volunteers that are working behind the scenes actually to get this online um, video ready every single week, and you might not know what goes into that. So in the next couple of weeks, I'm gonna be doing some segments called Volunteers Among Us, and I'm gonna be highlighting some of the behind the scenes stuff that goes on and has made River City Church Online possible over the last year of this pandemic. And so this is gonna be an opportunity for us to be thankful and maybe just remember to give um, some attention to some of those volunteers. You can send them notes and things like that behind the scenes, um, just to let them know that you really appreciate them. Okay, so that's coming up, volunteers among us. Okay, all right, so back on track with a couple of announcements to end. And these are important, so just hang on. Okay, uh, the first one is the Global 6K. I sent out an email about that this past week. And so I really wanna encourage you to go online to our webpage and click on the uh, button that is for Global 6K and just get in there and sign up to be part of our team. And even if you're not one of those great fundraisers and all that you raise for money is whatever you put into the pot, it's still significant and it makes a difference. And so go online and become part of the team. And uh, we do have a plan for that to be virtual if the situation uh, with COVID is that we cannot gather. We can do this virtually and individually per household by you know getting online and doing some rally time with uh, World Vision and then going out and doing that walk. Okay, next I wanna just uh, draw your attention to the last item today and it also is super important. We're gonna be gathering for prayer on May 2nd after our online pr premiere at 10 a.m. We're gonna be gathering uh, during the usual connection break at 11 a.m. We're gonna do prayer and communion, May 2nd at 11 a.m. All right, that's gonna be a wrap for today. And we're so glad that you joined us today. We hope that you will tune in next week when we continue our series, Why Pray? And so have a good week and be safe and be well.